So we are going to be talking about uh, thriving in your one doc DPC practice. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's a good way to start it. <laughs> like actually being a doctor. Um, <laughs> this is a, a picture of uh, my business partner, Milo, who is my therapy dog that worked in my practice with me. Um, he passed away this June, but he's, he was a great uh, partner. So basically, we um, wanted to talk about practices that aren't trying to grow and expand and add uh, necessarily more doctors, but that just want to be a good doctor for their patients. That's our goal. And these are learning objectives. We just kind of wanted to start a little bit with the slow food movement um, and a few similar movements and talk about how we think that relates to DPC. And then we'll, at the end, we'll go over, uh, the majority of the talk will be going over some best practices. Linnea. All right. Hi, I'm Linnea Meyer. I opened up Wellscape Direct MD in Boston in December of 2015. So I'm just coming up on my four-year anniversary. Um, it's located right in downtown Boston. If anyone's familiar with Boston, it's right across from the TD Garden, which is the big sports and entertainment um, uh, uh, theater. Um, and so I guess I'll start with how I came to be uh, a DPC doc. Um, like so many of you, I was in the system. Um, I started out in a community health center um, and then moved to a small private practice where I was there for about 10 years. During that time, that's when we had to convert to EHRs. Um, you know, the meaningless use came into play, all the metrics. Um, and so I just realized at some point, like, this is not for me. I felt like I wasn't able to keep up with good patient care and take care of myself either. Um, so I moved on, and I next went to a large national group um, that had just opened in Boston. Their model was more reliant on a virtual team that was supposed to offload the doctors who were seeing patients. Um, and I think one of the bigger takeaways that I got from that was, so this virtual team was all over. Um, so I would have patients call, you know, telling me they would be calling in for uh, an acute issue, and they would be talking to someone in San Francisco who had no idea that it was a snowstorm in Boston. And I can't get to the lab, it's snowing, how do you not know that? Um, so that really impressed upon me, like really knowing our patients and knowing what they're going through and kind of that, you know, local feel. Um, the other thing that I kind of picked up along the way was, and I'm sure we all know this too, is just the staff turnover and how much that impacts our patients. They like to have that connection. They like to know who they're going to, you know, be dealing with in the office. Um, and then along that same vein, um, as I moved from patient, uh, sorry, from practice to practice, I had patients who would follow me. And I came to realize, like, they wanted me, you know, and that was just like this, um, you know, uh, uh, just dawned on me how important that relationship really was. And they didn't care, you know, what the venue was, they wanted to see me. Um, and so then that led me to direct primary care. Um, and so my practice is very small. I sublet a um, small office space from a PT group that I know well who is very supportive of the concept. It's 250 square feet plus some shared space. I try and keep it as simple as possible, low overhead. I have no staff. Um, and we're going to get into a lot of those other um, details going forward. Um, I, I'll just say the last thing that I really value about direct primary care is the ability to bring your own interest into it. So I had a strong interest in complementary medicine, especially Chinese medicine. I've been doing um, Chinese martial arts for over 30 years. And so that really kind of brought this holistic and wellness um, approach to my practice. And I was really able to embrace that. And I would have the time to actually talk to patients about that stuff. So that's my practice. And Linnea is in Boston, right? And there's some other medical systems in Boston. And um, she takes care of patients that have gone through um, these big medical systems and nobody can figure out what's going on with them. And she takes the time and really is an amazing oh, dietitian and doctor. So, um, so my story with uh, my practice was called Renaissance Family Medicine. I started my residency in Seattle after growing up in Missouri. Um, and um, 
was joined a group practice there, like eight family doctors, which was wonderful. We moved um, for my husband's job. My husband's an uh, engineering professor, so you kind of go where you can get a job. And we moved to Southern California. And I joined a large group, about 40, well, I guess it would be called medium-sized group these days, about 40 doctors. And it was the big HMO time. I'd interviewed with five practices when I moved there. Um, all five of them had gone out of business before, you know, within six months by the time I moved there. It was the time when um, practices were getting $10 per member per month. Um, and, you know, everybody was kind of going out of business and there was a lot of crazy stuff happening. So one thing I noticed when I moved was in my practice in Seattle, it was insurance-based and everything. I mean, this was in 1994. Um, patients came in trusting you. <laughs> You know, and then when I moved, um, and it was just because, it, it wasn't because it was California, it was just, it was a little bit ahead of the rest of the country. People came in not trusting you, like, well, you're not gonna let me get my MRI, you're not gonna let me get what I need. Um, and so you had to earn the trust, it was a different, it was a really different feeling. Like, because of moving right at that time, I got to experience like what was happening to our healthcare system in a, in a really uh, strong way. Um, so I joined that group because I could do OB. I really loved doing OB. Eventually, um, as I have, after I had my second child, I stopped doing OB and, and joined the faculty at University of California, Irvine, so I could teach residents um, and work in the community health center there. And then I had a practice in the faculty practice, which was in the neighborhood we lived in, which I loved. Um, and you know, it was just kind of a normal practice. We had like kind of half paper charts and the problem lists and things were and med lists were on the computer. Um, I didn't realize how stressful it was until we decided to take a sabbatical. My husband got a sabbatical as a professor. And so we decided to move to Siena, Italy for a year. And I asked for a leave of absence and they wouldn't give it to me thinking we wouldn't go. Um, but I quit because um, we really wanted to go. And after I quit, I realized that I had spent every single day apologizing all day. I don't have your chart. I don't have your results. I'm late. Not because I was late, but because it was impossible to be on time. Um, and I realized, like, this isn't really fun to do, and I don't really think I'm providing good care. I couldn't see it while I was in the middle of it. So I had a year um, to basically, you know, take care of uh, the family, try to figure out how to live um, in a small Italian town, and, um, and figure out what I was going to do next. So right before I left, um, I found this um, conference called, uh, it was a conference put on by the Society for Innovative Medical Practice Design, which has changed names over the years. Um, it was, Garrison Bliss was there, there were a few um, kind of, um, this was before DPC existed, right? Um, and there were people that were like bartering with their patients. People would bring in eggs or, you know, they would work in their office um, for their care. There were also people charging $15,000 a year to fly around the country, you know, with executives that had serious health problems. So they're all different huge range, so it was really fun to get to see this huge range of people. About the same time, Gordon Moore, who's a family doctor, he was in Rochester, New York at the time, he quit a big HMO system, rented a tiny room from an ophthalmologist, and just had his computer, you know, his pen, and, um, you know, basically his prescription pad, his phone, and himself. And I got fascinated by that and contacted him as well as some other people did. And we ended up starting the ideal medical practice or first ideal micro practice movement and made it a 501c3 and such. And so that was a really fun group of people, kind of like this grassroots people just starting practices. So when I came back, that's what I did. I um, couldn't find space um, from Italy, so I opened in my house. We had a room that was kind of sticking off the front of our house. And I thought it was just going to be for a month or two until I could find space, and I ended up loving it. And I practiced there for like eight and a half years. No staff except for my, I ended up getting Milo because I found I never left the house. Um, you know, and so like I had to walk him. Um, and I basically practiced school hours when my kids were in school is when people could make appointments online. And then, you know, I, otherwise I would see them after hours if they needed to be seen, but that, those are my hours. So I was home all the time with my kids and got to go to everything at school and um, I, I really loved it. So that was my practice. That was in 2006 when it started. All right, we're gonna move to talk a little bit about slow food um, movement. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this, it started in Italy. Um, basically it's, it's, um, it's combating or counteracting the fast food you know, McDonald's um, kind of drive-through mentality where um, encouraging people to eat locally healthy um, food, 
that, and take time, you know, sitting down and eating rather than eating on the run. The thing that came out of that is the community supported agriculture, um, which is where you pay a monthly or weekly fee um, to a local farmer and they deliver a box of food someplace and you go pick it up um, so that you get, uh, you're supporting the farm with this uh, regular periodic payment and they know they can be in business all year and you're getting their, their high quality food. So we're th we think of DPC as kind of the, the community supported agriculture of uh, medicine. Slow medicine is one person that um, promulgated this term is Victoria Sweet. She has a book by this name, which is, is, is really nice to read. Um, she talks about unhurried, unrushed, and the process is important. So it's not necessarily slow. Um, it, you know, things can be very fast, but the, the, that it's relationship-based. Um, your presence is important. Seeing a patient in context of their community, the environment, um, the essence of medicine is story. And DPC allows us the time to take that story, to listen to the story. So this is just a, a, another thing like that. This is uh, my yeah, oldest daughter on the bottom there. Um, her favorite pizza place in um, Siena was uh, Pizzeria Principessa. He got up every morning at six, started the dough, you know, made the pizza new when everyone came in what they wanted and got it for them, you know, as opposed to coming back and um, going to Pizza Hut's. Not that there's not a place for that, but we're choosing to, uh, to be the other. And this is, you know, Ready Clinic versus um, a doctor making house calls. And Robin Dickinson, who's, in, who's on the DPC Docs page, she's one of the admins, I think, still. Um, she started it. Um, and she actually uses the name Community Supported Family Medicine in her practice. So she's really taken it to the extreme. All right. I'll show you. Keep going. Okay. Do you want to do it? No. Oh, yes. I'm um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so basically, we're just trying to move from running on the hamster wheel um, to being a creative healer in your practice. So these we th think of as our goals as quality, so not necessarily the cheapest, um, but the highest quality care we can give a patient. Um, time, artisan crafted rather than mass produced, sustainable to the physician. Um, this is really important to me now, this is the work I'm doing now mostly is in physician wellness, and I've become convinced that um, for primary care doctors, uh, direct primary care is one of the best ways to maintain your well-being. Um, we can talk more about that later. <laughs> um, I'm, te I'm teaching in, a re in the residency at UC San Diego now, or UC uh, Davis now. I'm kind of going back to the system after being out of it. Um, I think it's really hard <laughs> um, to, be, um, to be a professional and to be um, true to yourself and honest and um, in, the, in the system right now. And then relationship-based care. Okay, All right, we'll take it now. So um, we're going to go over some best practices that we think um, you know helps to uh, helps the solo solo doc. Um, this is by no means all inclusive. These are just some highlights, um, and um, everyone's going to have a lot to offer. Um, so again, we're starting with the never more true is if you've seen one DPC practice, you've seen one DPC practice. Um, so you can take advice, you can see what other people do, but just how we individualize our care for our patients, we individualize our practices as well. And that's going to depend on the community you serve, your clientele, your interests, your skill set. Um, and so I think our bottom line is be authentic, be you. Um, that's what's going to draw people. They're going to see that your heart is in it, um, especially when you're doing marketing, which we'll get onto a little bit later. But um, when you're authentic and you, you're feeling it, the, the pe people are going to notice, um, and they're going to be drawn to it. Um, so again, design your practice as you envision it, get input. Um, Focus on your strengths and, and interests, but also challenge yourself, but you can do that at your own pace. Um, and just remember that patients want you. So some advantages um, to being solo solo. Uh, first of all, you don't have to manage any staff, um, so that's a big one. Um, you have some increased flexibility in your schedule. 
Um, I know for me, if I don't have patients scheduled, I usually do virtual work at home. Um, and I try and consolidate patients, so I'm really only in the office maybe about three days a week right now. Um, and so you can also attend to other um, home demands, um, kids schedules, um, get a workout in. Um, and then the other point um, is that at, because we know our patients so well, once you kind of onboard them and you're really developing this relationship, often it gets much easier um, because you know them well. Um, um, another advantage from the practice perspective is that you really get to know all the ins and outs of the practice. You're doing everything. Um, so you know how it works. Um, also, um, so again, just recognizing that you know you're going to be doing everything. Um, so you're, you know, when the patient, from the moment the patient steps in the door to the end, it's going to be you. And part of what that does is deepen, um, gives you more time with the patient, face-to-face -face time, which helps to deepen that relationship again. Um, uh, the other um, big thing that we really uh, emphasize is low overhead. Um, and so when you have lower overhead, you can actually have fewer patients in your practice. Um, and that, again, allows for more time with each patient, and then you get more meaningful and deeper relationships. Um, and then the last point as well is, is again, um, emphasizing that as you get those relationships, um, sometimes patients who come in demanding a lot or really wanting to see you. I had a patient who wanted to see me like every week and we did that for like a month. And then all of a sudden, she was reassured. Like, okay, I know I can reach you, I can text you, and you know, she was fine. Um, so you'll find that often that people sort of need you less. Um, you so this is my um, little diagram of the complexity of, of staff. <laughs> um, so you have a patient, you have a doctor, and then you have the doctor-patient relationship. So there's kind of three things, right? And you got to love it if this is on paper. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to do it on PowerPoint. Um, so then you add an MA and maybe a receptionist, and suddenly you've got you know, the four people, but then you've also got all the relationships. And then you might add a biller, you know, if you're in a traditional practice, the insurance company, you know, and then you add in, um, I can't see what's up there. Um, I can't remember what was up there, but anyway. Another, another layer. Oh, that, like you add an NP, you add an RN, and you know, pretty soon it's like, there's so much stuff going on, you don't know who told who what, right? And so, not that it needs to just be these three entities, but it, I, there's a cost to adding staff, right? You know, there's, there's a cost, um, and so we just wanted to, to acknowledge that. I can talk about this. Okay. okay. So um, I will say that I knew nothing about business before I entered this. Um, and that was one of the scariest things for me. I come from a family of educators. Um, I was like, how can I do a business? Um, but what you learn is that you build your team. You, you know, draw advice from people who have more knowledge than you. There's a ton of resources out there now. Um, there's so many um, DPC docs who are willing to just share information. Um, and then you just um, go down the list. Um, so, you know, you figure out how to get your business license, um, your DBA, um, doing business as if you need it. Um, if you're doing a home practice, you know, there's more stuff for that. Get your bank account, all that kind of stuff. Um, and one point I'll, I will say in particular for the solo solo practice, if you are in a space by yourself, um, sometimes it's useful to get a PO box. Um, where things can get delivered to. The commercial ones um, can actually um, help do um, signatures if needed. Um, and so that's, so if you don't, aren't at the office all the time, that can be really helpful. And also just maybe as a safety measure too, um, so that people aren't necessarily just dropping by your office. Okay, so I think anybody starting, um, or almost anybody starting, is the mantra should be keep your overhead low. So this is what you really need. Um, Steve Zivich is also in uh, Massachusetts. He said all you really need is two chairs, your stethoscope, 
a script pad, something to document on, and you can build from there. You don't even need a script pad as long as you have electronic prescribing <laughs> or, and your phone, or your phone, I guess. Um, so really, like, don't spend a lot of money on stuff at first. Um, you get trapped having to see a lot of patients to pay for that stuff. Um, so these are just, we'll go through these pretty quickly. Um, consider subletting, uh, just running a room, space sharing. Some, some people do it in a gym, some people do it in a physical therapy office, some people do it in a, um, you know, a specialist office. Um, some, you can't do a home practice everywhere, but um, surprisingly Irvine is like one of the most planned cities in the country and for some reason um, you're able to do it there. Um, so check if you're interested in that. Don't get more space than you need to start. That's the, one of the biggest things I hear from people is, oh my gosh, I you know, leased this building or um, rent, you know, whatever, rented or built this building and I have all this extra space that I'm paying for. Um, you can always grow. Um, look for used equipment, furniture, supplies. Um, don't stock like you know, all these meds and all these things until you really know what you need because stuff expires. Um, and, you know, and it's expensive and needs space to store it. Um, now that we have the DPC docs group and stuff, people are splitting, you know, packages of suture if you don't need 10 of the same kind or whatever. So there's lots of ways to save money and um, use things before they expire. Definitely ask your malpractice about not only um, part-time practice because they go by how many hours you're seeing patients. And mine was, um, is 21. Um, so as long as you're seeing patients less than 21 hours a week, um, And also, the concierge or DPC, don't be afraid of using the word concierge when you're talking to your insurance company, because that's what we're doing. I mean, you're, you're providing higher level care um, to patients, and they give discounts for that, too. Um, group purchasing organizations, which somehow I missed. I didn't realize this um, at the time, but there's lots of them that you can join to get discounts. So labs, um, I thought, like, no one's gonna wanna deal with me. I'm like this little, you know, in a residential neighborhood. Um, and actually Quest came and visited, left a lockbox that I could have outside on my porch. Um, and I just called them when I had a specimen to pick up and they would come and pick it up. They'd deliver for free, you know, anything you need. I, did, I chose not to draw blood. I am not a morning person. Um, it's morning on the West Coast right now, pretty early, so. Um, <laughs> um, but I didn't want to do fasting labs at seven in the morning when I was getting my kids ready for school. And so I chose not to draw blood. There's ton, there's like a draw station every two blocks in our town. I feel like a Quest or LabCorp or whatever. And so, um, you know, it wasn't necessary for me. Some people love providing that service for their patient, but don't if you don't want to. Um, you can order the labs directly um, through your EHR sometimes. If not, you can print out your rec. You don't have to use their rec, you know. They may tell you that you do, but you can use your rec um, so you don't, to save yourself time. There's the whole issue of client billing, um, which you can usually get cheaper rates, but then you're responsible for collecting that money um, from the patient. And people have gotten burned, so be careful how you set that up so that you're getting the money from the patient, especially if it's not an established patient ahead of time, so you're not stuck with their lab bills. Um, I chose to. I mean, most of my patients actually had insurance and were paying for the practice outside of their insurance. And so um, I chose to just get a discounted rate for the patients through the lab, the ones that were paying cash. And a lot of them, you can get the results in-house. Um, the funniest, I thought one of the funniest things about setting up a practice was that you have to get a waiver to do waivered tests. Isn't that the clear yeah. waiver thing? Do you guys know about that? It's hilarious. Like in order to do tests that you don't have to have a license for, you have to get a light, pay for a license to say you're only doing tests that aren't licensed. But anyway, you have to do that for things. And now you can do flu, point of care, um, A1Cs. Um, cholesterol. Cholesterol, some other ones. It just depends on a cost benefit analysis what's worth doing for you. Uh, marketing. So Mavens, um, Atul Gawande talks about Mavens. And um, it's an interesting thing. Um, these are people that love what you're doing and will tell everybody about it. It doesn't matter if they're a, pa a patient or not, um, but, you, but you need to find those people that think what you're doing is incredible and then they'll tell everyone. Um, and so talk about it. You know, talk about it at basketball games or soccer games or church or wherever you go. Um, if you don't go places, start going places. You know, um, join the little business um, 
organizations in your community um, because once people hear about it, especially when you start talking about, gosh, when my, my mom and dad were sick, this is what happened, um, and that's why I want to have this kind of practice, that word's going to spread because there are so many people that aren't getting good primary care in this country right now, right? Um, once people hear about that, you know, two weeks later, they'll be like, oh, I heard about this doctor that you might be interested in when they hear a story from somebody else. So start talking to people. And the thing that's nice about that is, um, and we're going to talk about, um, well, it's at the bottom there, not just taking everyone. Find the patients that, that you love. I ended up with, um, because of my setting, I ended up with either um, executives or um, admin people at the university that wanted privacy. Um, I ended up with LGBTQ people driving down from Los Angeles because they couldn't find you know, a safe place. I ended up with people that had been abused by the medical system in some way. You know, kind of this amazing group of patients that needed good care that heard from their friends. And so if I'd started taking care of, I don't know, some kind of patient I didn't like um, because I felt like I had to take every single patient, that's, I probably would have ended up with more of them. Um, you know, and so find the people you like talk, you know, if you like talking, taking care of kids, start talking, giving free talks at daycares and schools about some kind of health matter. If you like taking care of seniors, senior centers love it. Um, but figure out who you like and where they hang out and go offer them something. And also people who get it, like that's the thing, who under, you know, can get the concept of direct primary care and what it is that we're offering. I think that's a big part of it, and that's, by, that's the piece about, it's not cherry picking. It's not like we're going out, which you know, is a common complaint, um, theoretical complaint about DPC, is that we're going around picking all the patients who are super healthy, and the, you know, those are the ones, but you know, if you look at my patient panel, they are, you know, it's, it's very complicated patients who, like you said, aren't getting the care in the regular system. My mom, bless her heart, um, always said, like, it's so wonderful what you're doing, but I don't understand why anybody would pay for it. Um, you know, and it's like, so, like, it, I it. never did convince her, and, um, it, you know, it's not worth time trying to convince people that don't think it's worth paying for it. They may come back later. You know, I had a lot of patients who I had known from my uh, previous practice in the town, um, you know, that didn't want to join at first, and then after something happens to them, wherever they're getting their care, they're like, oh, now I see why you're doing this, and they'll come. Um, networking with specialists, um, pharmacists often find patients that are unhappy with their, their current situation, urgent cares, um, you know, go, just go tell people what you're doing. Um, complimentary providers um, often, you know, also have people that are willing to pay and are unhappy with what they're getting from the system, and so, you know, if you can um, develop relationships with people that you trust there, you'll get lots of referrals. And always carry your business card. Um, this is really hard. This was really hard for me to do, like stand at a soccer game and say, like, oh, I'm opening a practice, because it just felt like I hated self-promoting. But don't think of it as self-promoting. You know, think of it as you're offering a service, and you're just trying to find those people that want that service and need that service. And so, if you're passionate about it, you know, it feels less like self-promoting. It's like, this is what I'm doing, and I'm excited about it, and, oh, you need a business card, here it is, you know? Because a lot of times people are just fascinated. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're ready for this, you know, really. Yeah. Okay, outsourcing. Um, so we're not saying you need to do everything yourself. Pay attention. I think this is good advice in life. Pay attention to what brings you alive and what you love doing, and certainly don't outsource that. Like, the idea to me of paying someone to garden is crazy. I love being outside. Like, I can't imagine, why would anyone pay anyone to do that? Um, cleaning my house, on the other hand, I am happy to pay someone to do the floors. Like, it hurts my back. I just, like, why would I want to do that? So, you know, pay attention to what you really like. If you, I for some weird reason, like doing the accounting. I didn't hire an accountant. Most people do. Um, but there, you know, find the things that you like and get someone to do the little pieces. You don't have to hire full-time staff for that. Um, things like a bookkeeping and taxes are super common. Blood draws and vaccines, like the county usually, or now um, pharmacies are doing all, most, mostly all vaccines. Um, so you don't have to do that stuff. You don't have to dispense medicines if you don't want to. 
um, if you want to and you find that fun, good. If it's like taking time away from taking care of patients, you know, don't do it. You can use GoodRx, you can use, you know, Target and Walmart $4 prescriptions and save people almost as much money um, without actually carrying the inventory yourself. It just depends how you want to do it. Um, getting, um, some people have used their kids or family members to do things like clean the office um, and then use that money to put in a college fund so it's tax deductible for you as the business owner and they're not earning, if they're earning less than $16,000 a year, it's, you know, they're not paying taxes on it, um, or if they're putting it into a, a 401k or whatever. Um, and so it's, it's good to think about things like that that lower your overhead um, and actually, you know, still kind of keep the money in the family. I, I was just gonna point out the last one too. I thought this was brilliant. One of the other solo, solo docs said this. Like it's not always outsourcing something at, the, at your office. Sometimes it's outsourcing the household tasks. Go get you know someone like you said to do the laundry or the house cleaning. Right. So, um, virtual staff is another um, possibility. I looked at the, actually you can get a, a virtual assistant um, from the Philippines um, for I don't know something like fifteen thousand dollars a year. I didn't do it. I looked into it pretty carefully, um, but ended up not deciding not to do it. But um, there there's ways to do that, and now there's you know ways you can pay more um, per hour to get. Um, you know, people that are specifically trained already, you don't have to train them to do that. Um, students, pre-med students, pre-business students, you know, would love to come in your office for a couple hours a week and do something you don't like to do, like call and get old records or, or whatever. And it, for them, it's exciting. It's not, it, you know, it's not... Um, they're learning something. They're learning. Um, and then another thing is, um, to, if, is to think of some of the things that we need to do, like cleaning the office or setting up the office as a mindful way to start and end the day, right? It's, um, you know, it's maybe five minutes and it's actually like, wow, you know, I'm gonna think about what I'm doing for my patients. And that can actually, you know, if you kind of reframe it, it can be a beautiful uh, way to start and end your day. Um, and just really simple, if there's something you don't know, like billing or a procedure or whatever, there's ways to learn and just ask, now that we have our Facebook groups and stuff, just ask people, ask, find other doctors in the area, ask people for help, people love to help. You're not on your own. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right, so systems and efficiency, this is another big piece, I think, of doing a solo, solo practice. You just wanna kinda get your systems in place to be as efficient as possible. So figuring out workflows, and, and I will tell you, this is definitely a work in progress. Like, you can think going in, I've got this down, this is how I'm gonna do it, and as you get into it, all of a sudden something's not working, oh, that's, I gotta change that. And you develop things, and you learn about new tools. Um, so um, figuring, it, so at least it's good to have a starting point, though, so start thinking about workflows. Um, some people set times to answer emails and texts. Some people do it throughout the day. Um, and the same thing with you know, all the other uh, data that's coming in. Um, you wanna create systems for tracking patients and urgent labs, um, those kinds of things. Paying bills, same thing. Um, I love to use it, I love to do the auto pay so I don't even have to think about it. If I you know, miss the date, it's not like an, uh, you know, I'm gonna get uh, dinged anything. Um, spreadsheets for tracking inventory is another um, important thing and definitely have expiration dates somehow so that you can organize and sort by that so you can keep, make sure you're keeping things up to date. Um, some people love to bullet journal and if you don't know what that is you can Google it, it is a cool thing. Um, and then um, Utilize your technology as much as possible. And again, this is a little bit of going out, researching, talking to people like EHRs, the text messaging apps, um, electronic reminder systems, all that, telemedicine apps, um, phone systems is another big one. Um, online scheduling um, can save you a lot of headaches. Um, and then, again, just realizing that the admin is part of your practice, and so you need to schedule some time in 
to do that and however it works for you. But then also think about the other priorities in your life and even think about scheduling those. Um, so your CME time, your outside activities. There's me doing my uh, unicorn stance for my kung fu. Um, exercise, date and friend nights. Um, and then um, one solo solo doc on Facebook said, don't feel guilty if you have downtime. She was, she was actually feeling a little bit guilty and had to kind of talk herself out of that. I mean, that's a great thing and that's how you are preserving yourself. <clears throat> um. All right, motivation. Um, so sometimes you are in the office by yourself and um, <laughs> um, it might be hard to get motivated. So finding accountability partners, um, the systems Lene was talking about, uh, rewards, um, one person was just talking about doing uh, burpees, like doing a chart, or she said 30 charts, which seems crazy to me, but uh, do 30 charts and then 10 burpees or something. Uh, but you know, f <laughs> figure out some way to keep yourself um, moving, and it can be fun. Um, don't let perfection be the enemy of the good. I think we all are probably some level of perfectionists so we wouldn't have gotten into medical school. And you know, we don't need, you don't need those 10 page notes anymore, right? You don't, we're not billing insurance, so um, you don't have to do that. Um, and then think about when you're at your best. A lot of people are at their best in the morning, I am not. Um, you know, so do use that time to do the things that need thinking and real attention. And then um, when you have mindless things to do, like, I don't know, scanning records or cleaning or whatever, put on a fun movie that you've seen a bunch of times so you don't really have to pay attention to, or music, or listen to an audio book and get those things done then. Um, when I met with one of my old patients, when I was thinking of starting this practice, she's a lawyer, and she said, um, Sharon, always under-promise and over-deliver. And I was like, because she asked me what I was doing, I'm like, oh, I'm going to be available on the weekends, I'm going to be available, I'll see patients, you know, when they need to be seen, they won't have to go to urgent care. And she said, don't tell people that. You know, tell them, this is what you're going to do. And then when you say, oh, I can sew up your laceration on Saturday morning, they'll be surprised and they'll love it and they'll tell everyone. As opposed to if you tell everyone you're gonna do that and then you can't one time, then it'll be like, oh, you know, you're not doing what you said. And that actually has been, I think that's good advice. Um, so, you know, be clear, you're not, you know, 100% time, there's ERs, there's urgent cares available. Um, you're not always, you know, gonna answer the phone instantly. Um, Figure out how to handle medication refills. I've never understood why refills are such a big deal. Just like refill until they need to come in for something and when it's done, they need to come in for a lab or whatever. Um, so I, I use online scheduler. Um, I hate being on the phone most of the time. So um, scheduling appointments online is easy for the patients. They wake up in the middle of the night and see they can get an appointment the next morning. They don't have to call you in the middle of the night because they know they can see you at nine or whatever. Um, all right, so now we have a fun little um, video from Elizabeth Eman, who is out in Renton, Washington. Um, she was here last year, and I got to meet her, and um, she takes care of an incredible um, community of trans patients that really like have been abandoned by their families and their communities, and um, she's incredible. So I wanted her to Hi, say a I'm few Dr. words. Eman. I'm the sole proprietor at Oodle Family Medicine. That's located in Renton, Washington. Uh, and the website for that is oodlemd.com. Um, I've been open for about two years and um, I'm working from my home office today, uh, which is occupied by the only staff I have um, and they get paid in treats. Um, this is Henry and Oliver. Um, and so I was asked to give some advice for, um, for people starting their own practices. And uh, actually my biggest piece of advice is just to be really open and transparent with your patients. Just let them know, hey, this practice, it's just me. I'm running it by myself. I, ideally, nothing will ever fall through the cracks, but sometimes something does and I don't get back to people in time. Um, and, you know, feel free to send me another email if you haven't heard back or feel free to, um, you know, give me a call and say, I, you know, I, I haven't heard back about this one thing or I sent you this email, did you ever get it? Um, I'm very open about that. Uh, I, I do the best I can. Sometimes I do miss an email um, and I'm just very straightforward about that. Uh, my patients roll with the punches. They're very good at uh, getting back to me when they need to and I give them a lot of responsibility on their own health care like they should be following up with me when they need their follow-up. I don't kind of keep track of everybody and their three-month appointment follow-ups and such. Um, 
So uh, it's great. It becomes more of a partnership that way, and that's the kind of practice I like to have. So uh, that's my biggest piece of advice. I have other advice, uh, but I'll save it to that for now. Um, and you can always reach me through my practice's website um, if you, anybody has any questions about opening their own solo practice. All right, good luck, everybody. Enjoy the freedom. <laughs> Yay, Elizabeth. So all that being said, we did want to bring up some things that you might want to consider if you're um, planning to go into a solo, solo practice. And the first is coverage when you go on vacation or you're um, sick or you know, you're at a CME conference. Um, so some things that people do are find other DPC docs that can cover them. Um, so that's one option. You can also refer to local urgent cares or minute clinics. Um, um, you can also continue to take care of your patients. I got off the plane to, uh, when I arrived and I had six text messages that I promptly you know, took care of. Um, and so uh, there are various ways to handle that so you don't have to be afraid of you know, what's gonna happen to my patients. And overall, like Elizabeth was saying, patients are very understanding. I sent out an email in advance. Um, obviously they don't all remember, but you know, they're very uh, um, understanding. Um, chaperones can be another issue or a question that comes up. It, it's never been an issue for me in my practice. I've never had a, a patient concerned about that. Um, but I am upfront with patients in advance. I don't have a chaperone, you know, and options are to bring a friend, partner, um, and there are such things as virtual chaperones. Um, pediatric care, I think, can sometimes be a little bit more challenging if you're all by yourself. Um, vaccinations might be a little bit more difficult. You have to have the office set up. I'm only seeing 18 and up at this point, um, just cause, primarily because my office isn't set up for it, and I, I found it too challenging to think about doing it um, on my own. Um, safety uh, is an issue to consider if you're all by yourself in a solo, um, in one office um, and don't have, you know, uh, you're not subletting and having other people around, so you want to think about how to protect yourself. Um, and then loneliness, which I think you had started to address um, already, um, because a lot of people do end up just being in their office and you're not seeing this huge volume of patients and you don't have staff. Um, so that's why I think these Facebook groups have been awesome, all these connections that we make when we come to conferences and the support we get from our colleagues and this great grassroots movement. Um, and then you can also think about subletting as opposed to getting your own independent space. I mean, I, I love subletting. I have a very supportive PT group that I sublet from and they, you know, I can open my door and see people if I need to um, and a lot of people working out too. Um, or I can shut my door and be closed off and, and you know, have my um, privacy. Um, schedule time with real people and then get a therapy dog or cat. And we listed some resources that some of the solo solo docs had um, found useful. Um, and now we have another little video of some other solo solo docs who are gonna give some advice. Hi, I'm Jill Shear from Whole Family Health in Olney, Illinois, town of about 8,000. I've been open since May of 2018. I have a micro practice of about 300 patients. Uh, seems to be going well. I had part-time help until she went on maternity leave, so I'm back to being solo, solo. Um, and I would say a great tip that I have is protect your boundaries. So at night I put out outgoing texts saying I won't return these until tomorrow morning, but if you need me, call me. Working on getting a phone tree so that uh, when people call in, I can d differentiate between what needs to be answered right away and what can wait until the end of the day. Um, and I basically created uh, flows for the day. So always start off cleaning off the fax machine, responding to emails and text messages, then see the first patient, call all new patients back at the end of the day, uh, pay bills twice a month, basically just trying to um, limit the amount of time I open up the checkbook, number of times I open up emails, um, and trying to protect my sanity. What I love the most is the freedom that I have. So I do Taekwondo with my son two nights a week. I golf once a week. I go to church with uh, my son's school on Wednesday mornings. 
and actually get to see my family. I also teach a healthy living class free of charge to my patients. Um, so overall, having a good time. This is Whole Family Health. We're having a good time in only Illinois, a small little town, but it's working. Take care. My name is Marty Schulman. 14 years ago, at age 46, I left full-time faculty practice at UC San Diego to open Encinitas Personal Health Care, 12 miles away in coastal North San Diego County. I spent way too much on tenant improvements, and uh, that was on way too much space, a thousand square feet. I also started off employing a medical assistant, but after two years, I was employing, excuse me, I was paying her, uh, but not myself, so I let her go. And since then, I've been solo solo, with the exception of a very part-time but very valuable bookkeeper. To supplement my slow to grow income from my family medicine practice, I did travel immunizations, and I did physician assessments for the UC San Diego PACE program. After my uh, initial lease was up, after seven years, I moved my practice three miles away to share a thousand square feet with two chiropractors, two massage therapists, and an acupuncturist. We have four exam rooms and a, sm a small office upstairs in a shopping center across the street from a beach. Um, it's very possible to practice in 13 and a half by 12 square feet. I have my desk, my exam table, my refrigerator, and my craftsman cabinet. Uh, best advice for going solo is to minimize uh, your overhead and those two biggest things, which I uh, learned early on, are uh, space and staff. So minimize those as best you can. Also, it is easier to convert a too busy practice than it is to start from scratch. I'm going to do a quick pan around my office. Please pardon my messy desk. And you can check out the view that I have where I'm stuck looking at the beach from my desk. <laughs> He's very proud of that. <laughs> Dr. Stacy Benson. I'm located in Dallas, Texas. I've been open since December 2016, so almost three years now. And I was a solo doctor until September of 2018 when I hired my MA part-time. She's now full-time and is amazing. Um, my biggest fear when I first opened was if I could do it by myself. You know, you're used to having staff everywhere. Um, you're used to having other doctors in the room. And in my, though my office is just 800 square feet, it felt massive to be by myself in. Um, so I actually did hire somebody when I was a month open. Uh, my husband begged for me not to. Um, you might hear that in another lecture coming up. Um, but I I was too scared that I couldn't do a give her a second shot. I wouldn't know how to do a strep test. Even though I actually, when I was working in urgent care, had nurses there teaching me how to do everything. Um, I was very concerned I couldn't do it. Drawing blood. I practiced on my husband before I opened, as many of us did, but I was concerned I wouldn't do it and what would patients think if I couldn't sink their blood. So I ended up hiring somebody. It uh, turned out to be not a good fit and they left after about a month, which turned out to be a blessing. So for about another year and a half or so, I was all by myself, answered all my own phone calls, had a baby, went on my own maternity leave with zero staff, went on vacation with zero staff, um, made it work. Um, don't let those fears creep up that you can't do it because you can. You went to medical school, you've opened a business. You can do everything. Just ask for help when you need it and learn how to do stuff you're not sure about before you leave your current job or, you know, we all have friends. Go ask a friend that's a nurse what they did, right? Because they learned different things in school that we learned. But you can do it. You really can. And if those fears creep up, push them down and fight forward. See y'all soon. Thanks. Hi, I'm Lisa Lucas. I am a family doctor. Um, I started Fulcrum Family Health in Freeport, Maine uh, this year, June 2019. I am six months in and I am a solo practitioner. Um, I opened my practice after being in academic medicine for 10 years uh, with the plan of opening a micro practice. Uh, my partner is also a physician and he is an OBGYN, so I wanted flexibility um, and the ability to make my own schedule. I've been growing as fast as I've wanted. I've spent a ton of time with my kids as I am also the main caretaker for our children. Um, I've had a wonderful time. My goal is to create a micro practice where I have full control of my schedule. 
I am able to go to all of my parent-teacher conferences, all of the recitals and plays and parades. Um, I've had a pretty easy go of it so far. I think if you are organized um, and you use the right platforms, it's quite manageable to do it on your own. Uh, at about 60 patients, I realized I needed a little bit of help, but I opted for help at home instead of help at my office. I still wanted full control of my office and I wasn't prepared to hire on somebody else and then have to deal with the extra administration, uh, administrative issues with that. So instead I hired someone to do the kids laundry, which has been awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> I Hiccups that I've run into or things like packages. Uh, if there's no one there to accept your package, that's an issue, so find a neighbor in the area that you can get those sent to. Um, other issues have just been access, but truthfully my patients have not had a problem with it. They're quite understanding about my lifestyle um, with my three kids, and since I'm accessible by other ways, it really um, hasn't been an issue. Um, suggestions would be um, Atlas has been amazing, very easy to use. Um, I added intake queue, so all of my intake is done online, so I don't have to worry about the scanning and the copying. That was a bit of an administrative burden. So once I took that off my plate and the laundry, it's been smooth sailing. I may consider hiring some support staff, um, maybe when I grow to 100, 125, um, but we'll see. So far so good. I really haven't felt um, too much of a burden. I just have had to stay organized um, because I think the freedom of being able to take my own schedule is more important than anything else. So good luck. You can totally do it. It is an awesome job, especially for a mom. So in conclusion, um, um, the, what we love about uh, DPC is that it's up to you. You can um, change things um, as you go. You're going to change things as you go, so you might as well plan for that. Um, I think it was Meg um, did the burping thing yesterday. She said she always has to tell people about burping in her lectures. So what I always have to tell people about is um, this app called it, uh, Out You'll Croak. Um, which is basically in Bhutan, you know, which has the national, the highest national happiness index of any country in the world. Um, the app, um, you'll croak or I'll croak? Somebody will croak, anyway. Um, <laughs> Somebody croak. The second I'll look. Um, so if they, they contemplate death five times a day and they say that's what brings happiness. And so it's this like $1.99 app, pops up on your screen, you, you'll, you're, you're gonna die. And then there's a quote if you wanna press it for a quote. And what that does for me is keep things in perspective um, because we are, right? You know, it's, this is all pretty darn temporary. And I think um, for me, like what's important is taking care of each other and the rest of it's kind of, you know, whatever. Um, it doesn't matter. You know, your business model in the end doesn't matter when you're on your deathbed, it doesn't matter. Um, and you will be. <laughs> and so, and it's not depressing um, once you realize that it takes away all the burdens of worrying about stuff um, if you jump focus in. on what's important <laughs> so you can jump in. Um, so that's my little... <laughs> um, be flexible. You can start out solo so you can add a psychologist, you can add whoever you want later, um, but just start off really low. Um, the, I had in here my budget when I started. I had super low overhead, I, essentially negative overhead because stuff that I was paying for before became tax deductible. Uh, and I can show you those spreadsheets later or maybe I'll post them. Um, you, you know, it, it doesn't have, you don't have to take out a giant loan unless you want to. Um, so think about where you are. Okay, so you're enough. What patients want is you, your brain, your training, your heart, your education, your experience, your wisdom and your humanity. That's what's important. Um, so we want to thank Lee, we want to thank the Physician Foundation, we want to thank all of you for being here because there's an incredible diversity and array of people here that are all trying to take good care of patients and that's how we're gonna help this country move forward by working together. Um, so this is our um, contact information. What I'm doing now is um, I do physician retreats for physician wellness in Napa. We moved to Napa. Um, and uh, 
We're happy to answer any questions now. Yeah, does anyone have any questions or thoughts? Oh. If you can go to a mic, that'd be actually probably the best. Yeah. Their mics are still there, I can't see them. Hi, can you um, tell more about the virtual, um, not the virtual assistant, but the chaperone? Thank you, the virtual chaperone. Do you know? Um, all I know is that someone had mentioned that that does exist. I, I'm sorry, I don't have more details about that, um, but I can try and find that. I think it's like having, you know, having someone on, um, not necessarily on video watching, but like a uh, presence, some, a presence, a presence so in the room. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe we can so answer So I have a question. How many patients is your practice currently? Do you want to? Currently? Currently. She's over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, the lights are really bright. Um, my practice is just over 100 patients. And my goal was 200, but it's probably going to be more like 150. She has super complicated patients. Um, and I did too. Right now, I don't have a practice right now because I moved to help take care of my mom when she was dying. Um, and for my husband's job, um, and now we moved uh, back to California. Um, but I'm, I'm planning to open in a practice again um, later or early next year. How, how big was your practice when you? It was there? around 100. Um, it was definitely part time because I was doing other stuff. Um, but it also I had complicated patients, and so I charged a little more than, um, you know, certainly wasn't charging $10 a member per month. Um, but everyone does their own thing, and that's okay. Um, yeah. First, I just want to say thank you guys for this. Um, it's incredibly encouraging. Oh, good. Um, as a solo <laughs> pediatrician in practice, seven months old. Um, but t two things. One, um, if y'all could show us that last slide again, that BU, because I couldn't cut, copy it all down, and my camera oh, wasn't sure. working yeah, on my phone. Bit. That's a good one. To... Um, but my other question is, it sounds like, at least for you guys, you have family support, someone else to help pay bills. And for single girl solo practice, I ain't got that. Um, so do you have any points for those of us who are, have dove into this with no financial, no financial safety net? What, any other things you would recommend differently or emphasize? That's a great question, right. And I do feel fortunate that I had a partner who ha has helped support the homestead, you know, throughout this. Um, I couldn't get a loan when I first opened, and so I did get a credit card. <laughs> and between that and some savings I had, I think I invested like 20K um, into setting up. And again, I think one of the big things I learned was, like, I overstocked. You know, you have in your mind like what a tr you know traditional practice is, and oh, someone might walk in the door and need this or that or the other thing. No, like you know they don't, <laughs> and usually you can plan that in, in advance if you need to get something. And supplies come pretty pretty quickly, so kind of get the bare bones. Um, otherwise, I think it's just a lot of planning. A lot of people do side gigs. Um, I do have a little mini side gig, but it's dog sitting um, because I love them. Um, but so a lot of people do do that. There's like um, veteran assessments. Um, uh, I was just talking to someone last night who's doing that. I have a colleague in Massachusetts who does that. And the advantage to that is that you know you get to schedule those people in your office. Um, there's also like dot exams. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can try and, and work into um, in a reasonable way so that you can still, you know, focus on your DPC practice but still earn some side money. I think it's harder if you're going off site to go, you know, pick up extra work somewhere, but sometimes you have to do that. Do you have anything? Yeah, I, I admire you. Yes. Um, right. it's, I mean, it's very brave. Um, and um, th there are a lot of supports. There's like the, there's a Facebook side gig page now. Um, if you're not on, um, like contact me and I mean I don't run it or anything but we can um, help get you added. Um, yep, there's a lot in. of different things you can do. You can, I look, um, the res, some of the residents are getting jobs. Um, you can earn you know $125 or $140 an hour doing urgent care which is frightening but um, in some ways but, but um, there are way to, ways to earn money but it is an extra challenge. Next. Hi, thank you so much. I told you I was gonna come to your talk and I'm so glad that I did. Oh, yeah. I'm going to take um, a second just to, no, I'm not giving a lecture, but while you were talking I was like, 
just kind of doing like a side by side with what I'm doing. So for all it's worth, for anybody who wants to know, I do have a, a very micro niche, solo, solo, solo pediatric practice. Mm. It's me, myself, and I, and my three boys actually are my employees because I told them, so you eat free food, so you know, do this for your mom. <laughs> but what they did, which was important for anybody who wants to know, is my son set up my practice. So my office is, is 100 square foot, it's less than this table. But they donated their Apple computer. And they, the, the middle boy is a geek. He gutted out the computer and fixed it for me. Oh. And so I didn't spend any money on their big Apple computer. I basically sublet my office on Mondays and Fridays. I have a lady who is a therapist who uses the office to see her patients. And I only work. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, because on Mondays and Fridays, I'm doing my writing and my blogging and my podcast. So again, you can do that. On the weekends, once a month, I do um, urgent care. It's $80 a, uh, an hour, but it's fine because it's just one weekend a month, and it's PRN anyway, okay? So I just wanted wow. to mention that I, my equipment was my brain, my stethoscope, and my portable um, otoscope because I'm a pediatrician. But really, because I only see kids who have behavior problems, I never really use my otoscope. But once in a while, they have allergies, and I throw in you know, a prescription of, I don't know, singular. But for that, I look at, their, you know, I look at them. My exam table was the thing that I spent money on. It was $179 from Office Depot. And then my, my, um, my office table was like 150 also, no, excuse me. My office table was 179 from Office Depot. My exam table is a massage table I got off of Amazon. So you don't have to do anything that costs too much money. Overall, my overhead is $500 because I pay 99 to um, practice fusion and $400 for rent. So that's like two patients. And I do charge a membership fee and I do charge a monthly fee. So it's, it doesn't have to cost a lot. And then to make me feel better, my teenage patients do poetry about what they are feeling, and then we do it like a drama little troupe for the, my patients. And we have a teen to teen support group. So there are many things you can do without really thinking. It doesn't have to be medicine, you know what I mean? Yep. But I, I just, yeah. I just that, wanted that to was, know. That's, you exemplify. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. exactly. So they do poetry because it's, you know, it's how they're feeling anyway. I make them write it, and then they read read it to me and it's fun and it's therapeutic. Yeah. Thanks so, for sharing. I'm, yeah, I'm, sure people will, I'm sure people will come talk to you about what you're doing. And I, I will just say about the urgent care, as you said, it is great PR. A lot of people are looking for primary care, so it is a kind of a way to build your practice. So I have a question about online presence and whether you try and manage those things, because I'm not a big fan of trying to manage a Facebook presence, Yelp reviews, Google reviews. Do you make an attempt to ensure accuracy of the information that's posted about your online persona? And if so, what are the challenges and benefits of that? Um, I ignored it um, until I was, um, when I was in St. Louis taking care of my mom and I covered a practice for another um, doctor who was deployed to Kuwait, he was in the reserves, and so I covered his practice while I was there, and um, had a patient who I had to report to like CPS, the you know, Child Protective Services, and gave me a nasty, nasty, nasty mm -hmm. online review. Um, and I had never asked anybody for reviews before, so it was the only review that was there. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I started asking old patients and stuff to just do a few. Um, so it's worth doing a few at least, um, so you have some, so it isn't like there's only one or two, you know, one or two weird reviews that you get from somebody that saw you in urgent care or wherever, because people, that happens now, um, sadly. But, um, you know, otherwise it just, it depends. I mean, it's an easy, it's free, like a lot of the Facebook stuff is free. You can boost posts and stuff, but if you just have a group page and post uh, interesting content, that you're sharing from other doctors, it's pretty much free. And so if you have maybe a, a high school or college student in the neighborhood that wants a small job, um, you know, they could share things from other DPC docs pages or something if you don't want to do it yourself. Um, I suppose you can be totally offline, but then you have to find patients somewhere. Um, these days, I think it might be the easiest to find patients online. And I, I have just used social media. I, have, I haven't done really any marketing other than word of mouth is probably the biggest thing, but kind of building up your reputation online. People will Google me. 
and say, oh, you have such a great reviews. And I mean, they're not even like all that recent. I've been in Boston for a long time, so I have built up quite a few. But um, so I, I do think you probably do need to think about engagement on some level. Um, and I try and post on Facebook. I am like, you know, I go for a spurt and then I fall off for a while. Um, but, you know, I do the best I can. I know some people do um, hire people out or, you know, um, get folks to help, um, but it can be costly. So, um, and you can do things like, you know, connect your Facebook to Instagram, to Twitter, all that kind of stuff. So trying to maximize all those tools to the best you can so you can just post one place and have it go everywhere. Um, and then other people do talk a lot about um, ads, and I was just talking to someone earlier um, during the conference about, you know, Google ads versus Facebook ads. Um, and uh, they were coming down the side of Facebook ads. Um, and I've heard that several places, but um, I have not tried either of them. It kind of, it depends where your people are hanging out. I mean, if you, yeah. you want to get, um, I don't know, earthy, crunchy people that maybe are, don't, aren't online, you know, then, but a lot of people are online these days, yeah. so no, I mean, it's, on some level. Is, is that answering your question? Is that? Oh, sure. I, I understand the marketing aspect of it and the importance of that. I'm more concerned oh, you mean, with like the accuracy of the online information. I mean, I Google myself and 90% of it is inaccurate. They have my med school wrong. They have my residency wrong. They have my age wrong. They uh, made me older. See, right. and, yes, um, and it's all those different like health grades and vitals. Right. And, I mean, I still have my practice in from residency. And several and it's patient hard reviews to get it out. inaccurate. People I know yeah. I've never seen. It is worth reporting things. It is worth like, you know, spending half an hour every six months and looking and seeing, Google yourself and see what comes up. And if there is inaccurate stuff or, or inappropriate reviews that, you know, then it's worth reporting and trying to get it fixed. And, and there's, you can go on and, and update things and you have to stay on them though because yeah, often it doesn't, yeah. It'll yeah. go back, it'll go yeah. back to where you were. Yeah, yeah. Right, thank yeah. you. Thanks. Hi, uh, so I had two questions. Uh, the first one is, you guys had 100 to 150 patients. How long did it take you to build that panel? To what? How, How long to did it take you to build your panel? Um, so I'm going to be coming up on four years, um, but I, it was a very slow growth process. Um, again, I opened after not having been um, in practice for about a year, so I was really starting from scratch. I had five patients who were clamoring me for to just open, open, because you know they needed, they needed me. <laughs> um, so I just jumped in, and I didn't even have my website up or anything like that. So I was kind of like, you know. Um, just doing things along the way. A lot of people will um, do a lot better with preparation, you know, like, you know, do marketing in advance, try and get a sign-up list going so you start with a, a larger patient base, um, which gives you a little bit of cushion, I think, going into it. Okay. Um, and then the second question, uh, at what point do you think you would have needed a medical assistant or, um, like, if you were to build even larger, how, how many patients until you need staff? I mean, I can't, I can't imagine doing it maybe, I don't know. If you had complicated patients that come in a lot. It, it depends on what you do. Three, you know yeah. what I mean? So again, most of my patients, it's a lot of coordination of care. Um, it's a lot of talking you know, through what's going on for them. Um, it's less kind of procedure oriented. So it may depend kind of on what your practice is, is doing for patients. Um, and, and I think, you know, everyone figures that out for themselves, like, do I need someone or do I not, um, you know. So I, I have not, I have not yeah. felt that I yeah. need that yet. I've thought more about admin help um, to offload some of the, like, you know, following up on medical records and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, rather than having like a medical assistant. One thing I did for a little while was um, there was another doctor like an hour away from me um, doing a similar kind of practice and she had a full-time like admin person that she didn't, you know, she was sitting around sometimes and so I would pay her like her salary to do a couple hours of stuff for me virtually um, that I didn't want to do like phone calls or whatever to, not to patients but to like, um, arrange things or whatever, yeah. So that worked, that helped both of us out. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to say thank you as like a mom of little ones and a DPC hopeful with a husband in a subspecialty. Um, I think I was losing the most sleep on 
how to keep my sanity with starting a small business and then making it successful. So for me, this is probably the most comforting lecture. Yay. Um, <laughs> And, Believe uh, me, I knew nothing. If I could do it, you can do it. <laughs> so I've heard a little bit about uh, medical malpractice that's DPC friendly. I went to my old malpractice and said, you know, I've quit my job, I need some tail, I'm starting a semi-concierge, and they were like, well, no change in your rate, we'll do you a favor and just keep it the same. Is there a company on the East Coast that you think is DPC friendly for malpractice coverage? I mean, one I, in California, I was in the Cooperative of American Physicians, which is a, a co-op of physicians um, that do their malpractice. And when I first talked to them, they were like, oh, you know, this is going to be expensive. And then I was like, you know, you want to come see? And they came and visited and like gave me a really great rate because once they realized what was happening, so maybe try again. And, and then on the group, we can, um, are you on, if you're on the, the Facebook CBC page, docs, um, yeah. there's a lot of people in, in all the different states. NorCal, so, I think, does everywhere. It's worth talking to them to at least get a bid. They, I drive by them. So in my, my house, state, but. Massachusetts, it's very highly regulated, so there's not much wiggle room. Um, at least that's what they told me you know, a couple years ago, and I, I'm going to check into it again. I think it's worth rechecking. Um, so depend, what state are you? North Carolina. Oh, North Carolina. Um, it might be a little state dependent, but I don't, I don't have more information on that. But we can try and find, put some It's kind of a little thing, too, is just make sure you realize what you're doing. Um, like, the rates are going to go up because they're, it's um, occurrence-based. And so the first day you start, you can only be sued for that first day. You know, after 10 years, you can be sued for 10 years or whatever. So, like, people were surprised the other day that their rates went up the second and third years, it's like, you need to plan for that. Ask them what the rates are going to be at um, mature, because um, that's going to happen. And, you know, make sure your tail is covered. Don't, you know, leave a job without a tail. I don't, I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> Thanks and good luck. I just have a quick question. Um, so, I know some people, I don't know if either of you did, but some people do house calls as part of their yeah. practice. And you mentioned virtual chaperones, but I didn't know if you had like a plan for safety with house calls, especially being a female going to people's houses. Yeah, I mean, I was lucky in that my practice was, um, I lived, had lived there for quite a while, so all my patients were pretty much people I knew from either from being a patient before or something. Um, the new patients, I actually, and, and I'm thinking about this now, starting a new practice in a place I don't know as many people. Um, I'm going to meet my new patients like in a coffee shop or something the first time, um, unless unless I'm in a practice, unless I end up subletting a space where there's a lot of, where there's people around. Um, and house calls, like I wouldn't do the first visit as a house call, um, but if you know the know the people, I mean it's a, that's an incredible. I did a lot of house calls and that was incredible. Um, I ended up doing, like, my first patient was somebody who had followed me from the university, and um, she, had a, she was in her 40s and had metastatic ovarian cancer, and I went every day and did one of those, uh, did paracentesis on her, and we talked about, like, planning my practice, and she was an incredible help, and it was, like, this incredible experience. Um, you know, so it's fun to be able to do stuff like that when you have time, too. Um, so house calls can be amazing, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and I was going to say the same thing. It's usually with patients that I know that I'm doing the house calls with, you know, so I have some sense that this is okay. But it's certainly something to think about and consider. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. How about an awesome round of applause for these incredible, inspiring role models? Thank you very much. Appreciate it.